so the title of my message now is Friendly Fire. And it is my hope that through this, God will make a different and beseeching appeal to all of our hearts today. At the beginning of this year, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Hales made this statement to the press. The Gulf War affords us an opportunity to maximize on our technological advantages and to minimize our casualties. A few days after that, he mistakenly fired a laser-guided Hellfire missile into a U.S. armored personnel carrier and a light armored tank. And two of his own countrymen were dead with six wounded. On January 29 of this year, a missile from an A-10 Thunderbolt killed seven United States Marines. And the sad truth is that as the ground war began, almost as many United States troops had been slaughtered by friendly fire as by the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, though the casualties were limited in the Panama, 60% of the Americans who died, died because they were victims of their own fellow soldiers' weapons. As I was looking into this, I read from someone who should know that perhaps 30% of all military deaths in all previous wars have been because of friendly fire. Lieutenant Colonel Bill Hatch said in Newsweek, March 4, 1991, when you have two opposing forces intertwined, it is very difficult to tell the friendlies from the enemy. Maybe that's what Ellen White meant when she said, the line of demarcation is fuzzy now in the church. And it's hard to tell which side the church members are on. The colonel also said that when you deploy units from 38 countries, this will intensify confusion on the battlefield. Many Allied forces were using the same equipment as the Iraqis. Syria and Iraq both used Russian T-62 and T-72 tanks. And because the men were wearing night goggles and could not distinguish enemy from friend, the United States forces were told to put nylon fluorescent panels on their tanks so that they could be seen by the pilots wearing those goggles. In other words, the United States said, you need a sign. You need a sign so that we can tell the difference. We need to know who is on our side. Another suggestion was that better communications would make it easier to tell the difference. For even our smart weapons cannot prevent human error. So if you would just talk back to us. King Jesus is a listening all night long to hear some sinner pray. Eighty millions have died in the 90 years of this century. Eighty millions. Enough people to populate a small planet. And the United States has been involved in most of these wars. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. Fifty-eight thousand plus died there. My sister's boy's name is on panel 13E of the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. During that tragic war, so many were killed by friendly fire that a very, very powerful book was written on the subject and a movie was made from the book. Think of the tragedy of being killed by your own. 
Hosea 4.1 Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore the land shall mourn. Lord, why are you declaring war on the land? Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Ladies and gentlemen, here is an hypothesis which can be tested. If God would condescend to use human speech, he would disdain our idols stained into our temple plaster. If God were to speak to us, he would put down our little fresco divinities, these imaginary deities who revel in riot and carry on their caprice in their cloudy residences. God would say, listen, I am a real God. And I've got something to say, and I want to say it in words which cannot be amended by man. And here God speaks in appropriate eloquence. Hosea called it the word of the Lord. Then he said, hear that word. Hear it. The prophet seems to be saying, we are brought together in this conversation with the deity. And I as a prophet will make no attempt to ameliorate or mediate what the God of heaven has said. I will not soften. I will not pussyfoot. I will not compromise. This is what God said. Now hear it. Thus and thus saith the Lord. When you read this in the Hebrew, it signifies that it is the divine word. And therefore part of the very essence of God. Remember the word was God. A symbol of the divine quality. Whenever the word of God comes, virtue has come out of God through the word. And it will help to stop our wasting blood. And to redeem us if we let it. Hosea said, I am a functionary of heaven. I have heard God. He told me what to tell you. Now you must listen. He that hath an ear, let him hear. And the sensitiveness of our spiritual ears can determine the quality of our discipleship. For there are some in the church that have ears and hear not. They have eyes and see not. They have heads, but they can't understand. Yet the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. No wonder Jesus said in John chapter 8, Why don't you understand my words? And then he answered, it is because ye are of your father the devil. The lusts of your father you will do. He is a liar from the beginning. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his own. Hosea, what is this impending announcement? It is this. That the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. So let the drums roll. Let the trumpets blare. Soon the thunder and the lightning and the tempests and all the winds of heaven will be let loose on a heaving earth. God's got a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. He is about ready to sow the cities with fire and brimstone. But first he will plow the earth with the seven last plagues. The doors of his arsenal are now open. The seeds of vengeance are about to be sown. The judgments of God are in the earth right now. This is not a gulf crisis we are talking about. This is the coming mother of all battles. And men will swim in their own blood up to the horse's bridle. Yes, you see, all controversies are not between nations, nor between men and men. All controversies are not the ranting and the contending of a rival who are upset and maniacal. This is the Lord talking. And he said, I've got a controversy. Now, we have our little controversies, but when we have declared our ceasefires, when we have adjusted and adjudicated and 
signed our truces and initialed our divorces and settled our little uproars by some arbitration. There remains the unsettled claim of God Almighty. He asserts himself through aggravated concern and merciful appeal. God says, I'm upset. You haven't settled anything till you deal with that. And even now, men in high blood and euphoria are missing this and relaxing too soon. They are failing to deal with the reality of God. They are striving through politics and treaties and religious compromises to establish what they call a lasting peace, as though the world were a planet unto itself independent of all of our God's other worlds and that it slings itself around the sun in all of its abominable filth out of harmony with God's will. While we today ought to realize there is a God somewhere. The world is hanging in His hands. So why do the nations so furiously rage together? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? There is a higher court and it's in session right now. And verdicts are about to be announced. And we've got to deal with God through His Son, the Reconciler, the Priest of the Universe. Nothing is settled until we deal with Him. And until then, in George Bush's own words, the thing will not stand. That's why the prophet reminds us that our mechanics will not cohere. The whole thing will fall to pieces. We will be always and continually patching things up. What's the trouble? The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Another prophet said, gather yourselves together. Say a confederacy. Make your scholarly pronouncements, you learned prognosticators. Forecast your utopias. Lose yourselves in wild euphoria. But the thing will not stand. So blow the trumpet. Let there be a great blast. It's midnight, for darkness covers the earth and grows darkness to people, and God's church is only eking out a little dim light. Joel said, blow the trumpets, you iron-mouthed prophets of God, but know that my warnings will always be despised. Blow it anyhow. Many will assail the judgment. Some will assent to it. Some will enjoy a sermon on it now and then. But who really believes that it's going to happen? That every man will be judged according to the deeds done in his body, both small and great. The prevailing logic even on our campuses today is that little things will be overlooked. I've had them say to me, Pastor, there are bigger issues to be considered, this, I believe, is a very subtle deception. Haven't they read where God said in Luke 16, 10, that he that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful also in much? Ellen White says the test is over small things. Nobody comes to sudden ruin, she said. It begins with small things. One violation of principle, she says. So blow the trumpet. You say you got no trumpet? Then lift up your voice like a trumpet. Call the righteous to a sense of duty. Call them from among the wicked and the reveling. Call them away from obscene materialism and worldliness. Tell them, I am about to say to the angels that hold the four winds, loose them and let them go. Tell them that many sit at the Lord's table whose names are Judas is Iscariot. Tell them that the test will come, and I'm quoting now, and those who have conformed to worldly demands and yielded to worldly customs will give up. Blow the trumpet. Show my people 
and tell them that they ought to know to whom much is given, much is required. That they will be beaten with many stripes if they do not come through. Tell them that I've already won through the spirit of prophecy that probation closes fast for the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Tell them that all of my punishments are designed for the willfully impenitent, those who worship the beast and the dragon. Tell them that my plagues are supposed to come upon only those who have the mark of the beast. Tell them to put on a sign so that when my pilots, the destroying angels, fly through the land, they'll be able to tell who is on the Lord's side. Tell them! Tell them that even hell is not for them. I prepared it for the devil and his angels. But above all, tell them that I am their friend, not their enemy. They are forcing me to be an adversary. But tell them I am their friend and I will have mercy upon whom I have mercy. Tell them that I will redeem them and lift them up to where they ought to be. Tell them that I will forgive their iniquity and their sin and make them what I wanted in the first place, a peculiar people unto myself tell them that the tragedy of being lost will be compounded if any of my people are caught in my firepower which is designed only for my enemies the antichrist the dragon and demons tell them I don't want them to fall by friendly fire I ran across a little book about this any water up here this book was written by a military officer and he gave reasons as to why our troops are so often wiped out by enemy, or rather, 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 by friendly fire. I thought it was amazing. Please listen. Reasons why we kill our own folks. Number one, they are just too close to the enemy. Second Corinthians six fourteen, come out from among them and be ye separate, save the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Revelation eighteen four. Wherefore come out from among them that ye be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Number two, why are people killed? Number two, we cannot identify them because they don't wear an identifying sign. I want to say to these people that we love so much here today, my fellow Oakwoodites, like the tanks in the Saudi Arabian desert, like blood on the doorpost, we have got to wear God's sign. We got to look like we belong to Him, not just talk like we belong to Him. God says, Brooks, tell them, my weapons are designed to be used against those who have the mark of the beast, not against my own. Where is your seal? Where is your seal when you're going to the beach on the Sabbath and to the finest restaurants on the Sabbath? Number three, why our people are wiped out? Because... They are caught moving in darkness. The Bible says very clearly, walk in the light as he is in the light. We got folk running around seeking a neo-Pentecostal ecstasy. We're running here and there trying to find something that we think is lacking in the truth because we're not willing to concentrate on the truth. There are no thrills anymore.
Number four, why are our people killed by our own soldiers? He said that during World War II, several of our men were killed because they were operating behind enemy lines wearing the wrong uniform. A college president walked into my office about three weeks ago and sat down in my chair. He said, CD, I was in a Sabbath school class in a large church. And the teacher had earring studs in both ears. He said, I wouldn't have misunderstood if she'd been there as a student. But she was the teacher. We don't have on the right uniform. In the newspaper, a theater burned down, and the ashes of a Seventh day Adventist were sifted from the refuse. Last year, a car was wrecked, and when they dragged out the drug saturated bodies, there was amongst them a Seventh day Adventist. Joel cries out. To the church, rend your hearts, not your garments. Oh, beloved, God demands a repentance that is moral, not ceremonial. He cares not for torn robes. This is cheap sacrifice. God is not concerned about that which is essentially dramatic, which satisfies the claims of men. Many are celebrating in services today who have nothing to celebrate. I believe in celebrating when you got something to celebrate. Some are celebrating false reports and pacifistic foolishness. I know what I'm talking about. Some are celebrating the idea that now we are free from obedience to God's law. Some are celebrating the idea that now we can disregard the standards of the remnant church. Some are celebrating the idea that the conscience-burning dichotomy between law and grace is now thrown aside. Don't worry about law. It's just grace. When did law and grace ever fight? Even when we get to heaven, we're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Law and grace. And perhaps worst of all, a young Caucasian Pastor's wife called me the other day and said, Pastor, it's being taught in our churches now. Once saved, never lost. And this is what they're celebrating. Beloved, let us not use the word repentance without heart contrition. Let's not let our lips give hospitality to eloquent penitence till our heads fill the agony of godly sorrow. This involves rejecting sin and turning away from it. And I want to throw in, Lord have mercy, it involves being sorry for sins great and small. Not just sorry for consequences. What good is it going to church if the heart is absent from the sanctuary? The Lord has a controversy, and the world is ripe for judgment. But you want to hear something more solemn than that? The church is ripe for judgment, too. Why is God disquieted? Why is He upset? He tells us. Because there is no truth. No mercy. No knowledge of God. The Son will not have it. The stars are annoyed. With their infinite precision, they will not accept slipshod, imprecise, faithless rejection of law, discipline, and regulation. That which is uncertain in Nambi Pambi and Hala can never appeal to the stars. For the heavens declare the glory of God. 
And the heavens will not applaud our high-sounding theories when there is no truth in the land. From one of our own journals, a man greatly trained and respected said he believed in theistic evolution. The heavens declare... But his brightest argument was that light from some stars had to head this way billions of years ago and traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, it took billions of years to get here. Therefore, matter must have been here to receive the light. That's incredible. And I was incredulous. If the stars had witnessed such a thing, they would have cried out, He who said to nothingness of palpable darkness, Let there be light, could also say, Let there be light right now. And he would wave the traveling time. Is anything too hard for the Lord? God will continue his controversy till the crooked places are made straight and the rock places are made plain and all this intellectual shucking and jiving is put aside there is no truth and no faith in the truth that does remain man's greatest sin after all is unbelief and if we only believe we could rest Ministry of Healing, page 414. I'm quoting verbatim. In the creation of the earth, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. All things material and spiritual stood up before Jehovah at His voice. That there is that there. I don't need any articles now. Remember preaching a sermon not long ago. There are a lot of things that are true, but they're not the truth. Doctor told my brother-in-law who never smoked, if you smoke a cigarette each evening as you sit in your chair watching television, it will help you to relax. That's true, but it's not the truth. The truth is that your body is the temple of the living God. And God said, if you defile it, I'll destroy you. That's the truth. Somebody else said, a little wine will brighten your afternoon and help you to forget your troubles. It will relieve tension. That's true, but it's not the truth. The truth is, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it moves itself aright at last, or alas. Biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. That's the truth. Somebody said if you watch soaps every day, go to the movies and get the right things to show on your VCR, it doesn't hurt you. It's just life. That's true. But it's not the truth. The truth is that the brain has delicate sensibilities. And God never intended, said Ellen White, that man should even know what evil was. By beholding, we become changed. That's the truth. And Romans chapter 16 and verse 19, Paul said, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. I want you to know all the good you can, but all this filth, the less you know, the better off you are. That's the truth. And then God said, there's no mercy. The Hebrew says this is a full word involving many dimensions and everything in the nature of love and pity and kindness. And having read that, I want to add one more. Witnessing. Come on, say amen. Mercy. Mercy is not a condescending act as though you rise up and look around and say, whom shall I be good to today? Mercy is evidence. That you're drawing light from the true line, which is evidence that you yourself are attached 
to the true vine. If you are attached, you've got to be merciful. If you abide in Him, you've got to be merciful. You cannot see destruction coming and fail to warn your neighbors and your family in Christian witnessing. That would not be merciful. Sometimes I fear we've lost our sense of mission. My heart rejoiced several times already when I heard it said. What I heard when I came here, that we come to be prepared and depart to sin. And if through our journals or our example, we give the impression that Oakwood is all about yuppies, which car is driven and who is famous I will tell you that as long as God sees this there's going to be a controversy and finally when he destroys the earth and puts it back together again and gives it a fresh start there's going to be some folk missing there is no truth there is no mercy and then he said no knowledge of God please notice these are uh, these are action nouns And they come out of their abstract retirements and gradation of approach uh, to produce a concrete affrontery to God. And the evidence is everywhere. No truth. And a slick lie will come along. And if possible, plant himself on Oakwood's campus and build a house there where God intended from 1896 that nothing but the truth and loveliness should keep house there. Dr. Reeves, I wish I could tell folks how impressed I was when I came to Oakwood. Didn't have a gym. Dormitories made out of wood. Only one or two nice buildings. But I wish I could tell you how impressed I was. I stayed for three months, went home for Christmas, and even the girls I had associated with in high school didn't look right anymore. Oakwood made the difference. No mercy. So cruelty says, here I will whet my knife, and here I will hone my axe. I'm going to hurt me somebody. Politics, that is church politics, can cause evil ministries to proceed. We have become less sympathetic, it seems to me, than we used to be. We've got an uh, don't care attitude, a moral outrage. And cruelty comes in and makes God's creation bleed. It scorches the earth. And we forget about the widows and the homeless and the hungry and leave that to Liberty College in Virginia and Anderson College in Indiana. No knowledge of God. How can His image be perfectly reproduced in us when we have no knowledge of Him? Therefore, Therefore God says, the land, the land, the earth that we live on shall mourn the fish are uneasy because the sanctuary is thrown down. There is drought and crop failure and we call it an act of God. No, it's more the act of man with his greed. He pollutes our earth, opens a hole in the ozone, allows no fallow time for the fields. He pushes them with his chemicals. We get food that makes us fat but we don't get strong. What's wrong? The Lord hath a controversy. We're the inhabitants of the land. Deny it if you want to. But human denial is not necessarily an expression of supernatural genius. This is not a human contention. This is a divine fight. God is going to battle with godlessness. And we ought to remember that our God is a mighty God of war, and He never lost a battle. And yet God restrains Himself. He's got four angels 
standing at the four corners of the earth. They can handle Saddam Hussein. They can take care of other warlords. But when God finally says to them, let go, no man on earth can arbitrate. UN resolutions will be null and void. Sanctions will be ineffective. You can't cut off his supply. He said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. No knowledge of God in the land. At a time when we have a knowledge glut. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now we've quoted that in sermons for ages. But when I got to looking into it, I found a little something. One scholar said that there should be a definite article supplied. I'd like to read it with a definite article in place. My people are destroyed for the lack of the knowledge. Would you say amen out there? There's only one knowledge worth acquiring. True science validates the Bible, and true theology leads men to a full revelation of God. Yes, and this is the whole purpose of Oakwood College and all its attendant expenses. When I came here, I didn't know anything. I thought Ellen White was Sister Knight. Yes, Sat in those classes, empty, didn't plan to be a preacher, hadn't made any preparation, but I thank God for Calvin Mosley, C.T. Richards, E.E. E. Rogers, Dr. Dykes, and the rest of them who began to impart knowledge so that I could go out into the field and preach the gospel to men and women and baptize them into present truth. Truth must not, not be neutralized with information. Information is a highly changeable quantity. It changes by enlargement. It changes by self-correction so that information one week can be obsolete the next week. But truth never dies. In the Review and Herald in 1903, Ellen White says the old truth given to us at the beginning, are to be held, held far and near. Time cannot lessen their value. Would you all say amen out of hell? If God is not preeminent, the controversy will never be settled. Old Caucasian buddy of mine knocked on my door week before last, hadn't seen him in years. He threw both arms around me. I said, sit down, man. How's it been? He said, well, I divorced my wife. Well, that's sad news, and I didn't need to know the reasons why. He said, but now I'm about to marry a fine young lady. Of course, she's not of the faith. So what I did was join her church. By that time, I had set my eyes on him. And I saw a cloud come over his countenance, and he dropped his head, and his eyes misted. He said, but Pastor Brooks, my conscience is bothering me. I said, glory to God, you've not driven the Holy Spirit away. There's a controversy going on in your head. Who's going to win? Well, I want to tell all of us, including myself today, we got to make up our minds to settle this issue by selling, selling, selling all our possessions in order to purchase the pearl of great price. And all uh, represents totality, but totality is less than the value received. Did you all get that? It's not a transference of value for value. If you get rid of your jewelry, you got a starry crown coming. If you give up your Babylonish dresses, you're going to wear a long white robe. If you take on or let go of the prohibited diet, you're going to eat from the tree of life. If you give up your poisons, you're going to have eternal life. Yeah. Now, i got to close. Listen, God's judgments are already in the air, but you ain't seen nothing yet. 
When I study and preach on the seven last plagues, I tremble. Boils, noisome and grievous and runny and stinking. Water in the seas and the fountains turned to blood. Sun blistering men's body. Darkness so palpable it can almost be felt. And then comes Armageddon. And God shall settle out by raining down his hail. And there's no patriotic missile that can intercept these. These are not Russian scuds. They come out of the armory of God. They will tear down everything man has built up. Seek ye the Lord. While he may be found. Yes. Call ye upon him while he is near. Don't wait till you see the boils come. It's too late. Too late. Seek him now. As I live, save the Lord. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? He's talking to the church. Turn! Yes, sir. The Lord, if I turn, then what? If you turn, I am not like the United States militia that makes mistakes. If you turn, a thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. If you turn, you're going to be hid. And church, I feel it today. I need a shelter. But God has drawn a line in the cosmic sand. He's saying now who is on the Lord's side. Come out of her, my people. He didn't say come out of her, Oakwoodites. He didn't say come out of her, Seventh-day Adventists. He said come out of her, my people. And Paul said to Timothy, the testimony of the Lord standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He can look out there. He can look up here. He can look at me after all those wonderful words of introduction. And God knows the heart. He knows who's on his side and who is not. But he hasn't given up on us. No one understands like Jesus. Nobody can look at you struggling and stumbling and fumbling and bumbling and write you off. Because they don't know how you're talking to God. They don't know how you're struggling to overcome. They don't know how badly you want to put on that habit. No one understands like Jesus. The other day I was reading another book. And it said that the Jews piled up epithets that they might scale the heights to the divine. Circumcision was a big leap. Toward the divine. Ah, but ladies and gentlemen, our Jesus operates in the opposite direction. He comes from the bosom of the Father. Out in California at a youth congress, they sang a little song I haven't heard since. All the way from heaven down. He came all the way from heaven down. Think about the condescension, condescension this Easter weekend. He came down. One theologue said it was like diving into a barrel of maggots. Jesus came all the way down that he might save from the bottom up. He didn't stop at the palace. He came on down to a little humble cottage like some of us have to live in. He didn't stop in the holy city of Jerusalem. He came on down to the ghetto of Nazareth where one of his own disciples wondered if anything worthwhile could come out of it. He didn't stop with the rich. For our sakes he became poor. He didn't stop with the lawyers and the scribes. He came on down to the common people. He didn't stop with those who are beautifully endowed like Absalom of old. He came on down to the rotten 
that degenerated lepers and he made them whole. He didn't stop with the social elite. He ate with the publicans and sinners. He came down. Bible says we were made in his image. But because we played the fool, he had to be made in our image. So a body was prepared. He took on flesh and he won the battle in the flesh. But instead of just scaling his way now back up to the Father, he took all of us and loaded us on his shoulder and on his heart. And he said, as I rise, you can rise. Come on, say amen. Father, I want those that you've given me be with me where I am. I'm down here, Father, but I don't want to come back unless they can come. I want them with me, Father. I don't want eternal joy without them. I don't want a great white throne without them. He proceeds from the bottom to the Father, but he takes us with him. I can almost hear the Father say, Son, in order to work that out, it's going to cost you. The Son said, Father, I'll pay. I'll pay. I will redeem fallen man with the gold of my blood and the silver of my tears. The Father said, Son, you're going to make yourself a ladder between earth and heaven? The Bible says Jesus is the ladder. But who in the world can ascend on such perfection as that? Well, that isn't all Jacob saw. He said, I saw a ladder, but I saw angels ascending and descending. In other words, these angels that are ministering spirits are on every road to help us on up the next step. If you've got spiritual arthritis, just grab the hand of an angel and he'll bring you up another step. There are things about God we can't understand. Well, we have to accept them anyhow. We can't explain them, but we got to believe them. we got to know God by heart when we can't know Him by intellect. It's got to be like my old namesake C.L. used to sing. There's got to be something within that holdeth the rain. Something within I cannot explain. Because, beloved, as surely as you're born, and I'm closing now, there's going to be a fire fall. Yes. Oh, I'm thinking about it now. It's closer than it ever was. I'm thinking about it now. I get on my knees sometimes in the middle of the night when my family's asleep. And I say, Lord, don't let me fail. Please, don't let me preach to people and baptize hundreds and go to hell myself. Lord, don't let me fail. But there's going to be a fire fall. Revelation 20 and verse 9 says, The wicked go up on the breast of the earth and compass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire comes down. Matthew 25, 41 says, All of that fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. But now wait a minute. There is a second resurrection. And some of our esteemed alumni, God forbid, but some of our esteemed alumni going to rise up in the second resurrection. They're going to turn toward the east expecting to see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. But instead, there is the effulgent glory of the holy city that is already settled on Mount Zion. Then they look around. They look around. And they see they are surrounded by darkened souls. Oh, Hitler is there. Saddam Hussein is there. All kinds of wicked men, drug pushers and drug dealers are there. Some who would have nothing to do with the Lord are there. And we upwardites. No, sir, I'm not going to put myself in that gang. Some of you upwardites are going to look around and realize you've slept a thousand years too long. And the Bible says graphically, there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth too late. Please, for Jesus I'm appealing. Come off enchanted ground. I borrow that word from inspiration. It's thrilling over there. It's bewitching over there. Come off 
put on the right uniform. Let the world know whose side you're on. Come out of darkness in the marvelous light. Come on out. I'm reading from letter 35, 1898. Those who have united with a Seventh-day Adventist church calling themselves the commanded people of God and yet possess no more vitality and consecration than do the nominal churches will receive the plagues just as verily as the churches that oppose the Lord of God. Adventists! Ellen White says some are going to get the mark of the beast and some are going to receive the plagues, please. Friendly fire. No! In the name of Jesus. No! But something can be done. Jack Sequeira ran the week of prayer at the general conference. He said one day he was waiting in a train station, I believe, overseas. And a young man came up to him and he said to him, Are you saved? Dr. Sequeira understood what he meant. But he said, What do you mean? From what? He said, From sin. He said, Do you mean the power of sin? Or the presence of sin? Or the results of sin. The young man was a bit intimidated. He backed off. He said, well, you must be a preacher yourself. Dr. Sequeira said, well, I am. But you say you were saved. Oh, yes. When were you saved? He said, I was saved three months ago. Dr. Sequeira said, no, sir. You were saved over 1,900 years ago. You just had sense enough to accept it three months ago. Listen, we've all been saved. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not faith that will give him entrance into the kingdom of God. March 10, 1904. Fourth volume of the Testimonies, page 367. We will not attain to the full statue of Christ till our probation closes. There are two things that have to be reconciled. God can keep us from sinning, but you'll never be satisfied with yourself. And when you come down to the point of death or the probation, uh, the closing of probation, it's at that time that amazing grace takes over. And Ellen White says, when God sees you've done your best, He accepts this as your best service and then makes up for your deficiency through the righteousness of Jesus. I joined the lady, the young lady who is president of the student movement. Jesus is all we need. 1945, I was helping my mother with a chore in the backyard. In my hometown, the corn textile mills were the only essential industry. And they had some giant steam whistles. Those whistles would sound off every morning at quarter to seven. Then again, at seven o'clock their decibels would make the earth quiver and nearby there was another mill called proximity and when the corn mill would sound off proximity would answer antiphonally and I want to tell you it was awesome when they both cut loose but on this summer day in 1945 All of these big whistles turned loose at the same time. Everybody's attention was arrested. They could be heard for many miles away. Mother and I were out there working in her flowers. It it shook her so her eyes were enlarged. Mother stood up from her labor and she said, Son, what is that? What is that? What does it mean? I said, Mother, the war is over. Glory to God, the war is over. The war is over. Soon and very soon, we're not going to hear a steam whistle, we're going to hear a trumpet sound. The war is going to be over. Going to lay down my sword and shield. Study war no more. No more oppression. No more heartache. 
No more abuse and scorn. No more being pushed around. The war is over. I want to tell you about euphoria then. They're going to be shouting in the streets. We're going to be in a land where there is no night. And in the book Great Controversy, Ellen White says there will be no need nor desire for repose. Not even going to get sleepy, y'all. Going to be full time rejoicing. 24 hours a day in a land where it's day all the time. Euphoria. Not going to be in HAACP. That's a heavenly association for the advancement of colored people. In Great Controversy, page 617, Ellen White says, The loves and sympathies which God himself has planted in the soul will find sweetest exercise, pure communion of holy beings, harmonious and social life will blessed angels and faithful ones of all ages. Social life with angels and faithful ones of all ages and the sacred ties that bind the whole family in heaven and in earth. These help to constitute the happiness of the redeemed. Let everybody say amen. Oh, church, I want to get to him. Now, I'm going to say it, and you just have to forgive me. It's going to be wonderful to be in heaven. But to be black and in heaven is going to be special. Listen to me. If you're black and don't, don't go to heaven, you will have caught me twice. Ellen White says we're going to be exalted above angels. Every creature in heaven, every creature will start shouting blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Last night, I got to thinking about it. I went to Elder Ward's office and borrowed the great controversy. I wanted to read it one more time. Let me, this is it now. I'm closing right now. This is the last paragraph in the great controversy. It says, the controversy is ended. Oh, listen, I expected you to say amen. How can you sit there and not sing? The controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony gladdens every heart in the vast creation. From him who created all, flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. And it ends with that. Glory to God. That's how it ends. If I had just one postscript, I know you ought to be anxious to know how long is this glory going to last. Handel picked the words out of the Bible and said, Forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah! 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 International Copyright 1992, American Cassette Ministries. All rights reserved. Thank you for requesting American Cassette Ministry Cassettes. We're helping prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ.